Well, let me, uh, let me thank everybody for taking the time to come out. Uh, we're here, and I'll take this off for a moment. Uh, we're up here back in Butte County, and I say back because it's very familiar. Uh, this county to many of us, not only across the state of California, but for that matter, uh, around the rest of the nation and the rest of the world, ravaged by historic wildfires just two years ago, took the lives of over 85,000 souls, uh, campfire in paradise. Uh, we're not that far away uh, from uh, that area uh, here in a county uh, that's not only once again being ravaged by wildfires, but by uh, incident after incident uh, that have required emergency efforts, heroic efforts to evacuate individuals and to address uh, the acuity uh, of a climate crisis that we're experiencing, not only here uh, in the state of California, but in many parts of the world. Uh, if you do not believe in science, uh, I hope you believe in observed evidence. Uh, you walk around uh, this community, you walk around uh, this uh, park around Lake Oroville, uh, you see uh, the reality, a reality that is set in uh, in this state in very indelible ways. And that is we're in the midst of a climate emergency. Uh, we're in the midst of a climate crisis. Uh, we are experiencing weather conditions, the likes of which we've never experienced in our lifetime. We're experiencing what so many people predicted decades and decades ago, but all of that now is reality. It's observed. Uh, it is part of a consciousness. It's part of the experience, not just the expression uh, that is the state of California. 3.154 million acres burned as of this morning, close to 3.2 million acres burned in the last number of months here in the state of California. Over 7,700 wildfires. Uh, this contrast to last year, where we had 4,900 wildfires and 118,000 acres burned, 26 times more acreage burned this year in the state of California than in 2019. Tens of thousands of people being evacuated. Uh, the science is absolute. The data is self-evident. The experience uh, that we have in the state of California just underscoring uh, the reality uh, of the ravages of climate change. And when I talk about the challenges here in Butte County, uh, it's not lost on anyone who lives up here. The 200,000 people that were evacuated a few years ago in 2017 related to the spillway here on the Lake Orville Dam uh, where we had to evacuate because of the massive amount of water uh, and the runoff into the lake where the lake was overflowing uh, because, again, of the acuity of extremes, because of the climate. Uh, and so we say this often, and I'll say it again, the hots are getting a lot hotter, the dries are getting a lot drier, and the wets are getting a lot wetter. That's climate change. That's what the scientists predicted. That's the reality that we're experiencing here in the state of California. We have to own that reality and we have to own a response to that reality. And one thing that's crystal clear to me, uh, good enough never is. In the state of California, while it's led as it relates to climate change, we've got to step up our game. While we have audacious goals, while we're leading the nation in low carbon green growth, as we've led the nation in our efforts to decarbonize our economy, we're gonna have to do more and we're gonna have to fast track our efforts. Well, it's nice to have goals to get to 100% clean energy by 2045. That's inadequate to meet the challenges the state and I argue this nation faces. We're going to have to fast track our efforts. We're going to have to be more aggressive in terms of meeting uh, our goals much sooner. And I have tasked now our administration uh, led by two members uh, to my right, uh, Jared Bloomfeld, who runs the EPA in the state of California, and Wade Crowfoot, who runs our resource agency, uh, to go down uh, in every prescriptive goal that the state has, to go down that list uh, and to dust off our current processes, our, our current uh, strategies, uh, and accelerate all of them across the board uh, in terms of uh, the work we're doing uh, to not just broadly 
decarbonize our economy, but to specifically uh, adapt strategies to get uh, more electric vehicles out on the street and to electrify our transportation, uh, to focus on our land use efforts in this state in a much more dynamic and deliberative manner, uh, to look uh, at our soils policies in the state of California, our industrial and agricultural policies in the state of California across the entire spectrum. Our goals are inadequate to the reality we're experiencing. Mother Nature's three things have been said by many people. Mother Nature uh, is physics, biology, and chemistry. She bats last and she bats a thousand. That's the reality we're facing, this smash mouth reality, this perfect storm. The debate is over around climate change. Just come to the state of California. Observe it with your own eyes. It's not an intellectual debate. It's not even debatable any longer what we are experiencing, the extreme droughts, the extreme atmospheric rivers, uh, the extreme heat. Just think, in the last few weeks alone, we've experienced the hottest August in California history. We had 14,000 dry lightning strikes over a three-day period. We're experiencing temperatures, world record breaking temperatures in the state of California, 130 degrees, arguably the hottest recorded temperature in the history of mankind in the state of California just a few weeks ago. We had 121 degree temperatures in LA County, Burbank Airport, 114 degrees. It was 103 degrees in one part of the state of California at three in the morning. You've seen the images now strewn across the rest of the globe, these orange glows, the, you know, quarter inch thick uh, you know, snow that is these ashes that are falling hundreds of miles away from these fires, fires that we are experiencing. North California, 800 miles down to southern part near the border of Mexico, 28 active large scale fires that the state of California is currently battling. 14,600 firefighters currently battling those wildfires. Mutual aid coming from every local municipality and mutual aid coming from around the world. We had firefighters come in from Israel. I was talking to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, was sending firefighters from Canada. We're reaching out to partners. Uh, I was talking to Governor Murphy yesterday from New Jersey. New Jersey is sending engines out here on the West Coast of the United States to the state of California. We have Utah and Texas, Montana has helped out. Obviously, Oregon and Washington, not only are we receiving mutual aid from Oregon and Washington, we're going to need to reciprocate and provide mutual aid in Oregon and Washington. They're also dealing with record breaking uh, uh, fires and loss of property. Economic impacts, if you say, all right, well, this is, you know, this is a health issue perhaps with the air we breathe and the air quality, perhaps this obviously has an impact in terms of the quality of life. How about the economic consequences? Just ask the folks here in Butte County, $2.2 billion just to clean up the debris related, just to clean up the debris related to the campfire, $2 billion just to clean up the debris. If I don't know, I need to emphasize it a fourth time the economic consequences of our neglect. You want to know the cheapest way to deal with this is to invest in the future, to invest in a low carbon green growth future, to decarbonize our economy, to change the way we produce and consume energy. It is the cheapest way to go. The biggest cost is in our neglect. The biggest cost is not accelerating and fast tracking our low carbon strategies. And by the way, California is doing that five to one. We have more green jobs than we do fossil fuel jobs. Five to one, not two to one, five to one. We're proving this paradigm. You can grow your economy, 3.8% average GDP growth in the last five years in the state of California as we move to accelerate the decarbonization of our economy. But again, it's not enough. And it's not enough to do it alone. The state of California doesn't live in an island. While it's the largest state in our union, it's not even large enough to have the consequences in terms of marking a greater impact in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And that's why we need to get other states on board. And I couldn't be more pleased in particular with our Pacific Coast Collaborative we have with Oregon and Washington and the leadership of Governor Brown, not just the current Governor Brown in Oregon, the previous Governor Brown in the state of California and Governor Inslee up in Washington State. We've led a partnership, not just in the Pacific Coast, 
but we also led a partnership in a U.S. alliance, 24 states plus California, 25 states that have come together, basically doubling down on the Paris Protocol. So as the rest of the nation moves in one direction, we are moving in a more enlightened direction. And I say we, that's 24 states plus the state of California. And that's impactful. Just think about California alone. This state, its population is larger than the 163 nations that signed up on the Paris Protocols. There are 196 nations. California's population alone is larger than 163 nations. So we wanna punch above our weight. We wanna to continue to punch above our weight, but we're gonna need, need more people coming on board. We're involved in dozens and dozens of lawsuits against an administration that doesn't see eye to eye with us on this. And rather than lamenting about it, we'll continue to fight in the courts. We'll continue to win as we are overwhelmingly against the rollbacks of the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act uh, and continue to make a case, uh, not even make a case, just you know, prove uh, what we've been asserting that these efforts will save taxpayers money, that will lower the cost uh, of consuming energy, uh, that will inure to uh, building more resiliency in our environment and allow us to leave something a little bit better than this to our kids and grandkids. People that want to roll back vehicle emission standards so you can spend more money at the pump and produce more greenhouse gas emissions to create more of what you see around me, that's beyond the pale of comprehension. We're fighting against that and we'll prevail as long as more people come to this cause. And so I guess, forgive me, I'm being a little bit long-winded, but I'm a little bit uh, exhausted uh, that we have to continue to bait this issue. This is a climate damn emergency. This is real and it's happening. This is the perfect storm. It is happening unprecedented ways, year in, year out. And you can, you can you know, exhaust yourself with your ideological BS by saying, well, a hundred years ago, we should have done this or that. All that may be true. And I'm not gonna suggest for a second that the forest management practices in the state of California over a century plus have been ideal. But that's one point, but it's not the point. The reality here is the mega fires that we're experiencing come from these mega droughts that we've experienced. 150 dead trees, million dead trees in our forests in the Southern Sierras, beetle infested forests those mega droughts impacting the mega fires. There's something else going on, not just bad past practices over a century related to forestry. That said, we do recognize we have to do more in terms of prescribed burns. We do have to do more on vegetation management. We do have to do more on our forest management efforts. And by the way, the state of California is doing more than it's ever done in that space. 35 high profile projects we got done would have taken it 10, to, 10 years based upon previous past practices. We were able to get those things done in 15 months. These fuel breaks that you're seeing, these high profile fuel breaks, including by the way, just a stone's throw from here, efforts five years in a row to create fuel breaks that have actually saved a lot of property, potentially lives just in this area. We recognize our responsibility to do more in that space as well. And we're doubling down on that still from what we did last year with a partnership with the federal government, the U.S. Forest Service, where we did a memorandum of understanding so we commit to the next few decades to do more in partnership to double the amount of acreage that we're covering through our forage management efforts. So we do recognize that, but that's not just the issue here in California, Washington, Oregon, and other Western states. When you have a heat dome over the entire West Coast of the United States, when you have temperatures, record-breaking temperatures, record droughts, then you've got something else at play. And that's exactly what the scientists have been predicting for a half a century. It is here now. California, folks, is America fast forward. What we're experiencing right here is coming to a community all across the United States of America unless we get our act together on climate change, unless we disabuse ourselves of all the BS that's being spewed by a very small group of people that have an ideological reason to advance the cause of a 19th century framework and solution. We're not going back to the 19th century. We're not apologists to that status quo. We believe in the fresh air of progress versus the stale air 
emphasis, stale air of normalcy. And so that's California. We're gonna leap in the future. We're gonna accelerate our low carbon green growth strategies. We're gonna create more economic opportunity in this space, more resiliency, a sustainable mindset. And we're going to advance this cause in partnership with hundreds and hundreds of subnational and national leaders around the rest of the world. One of the great inheritance I received as the 40th governor of California is the work of the 39th in establishing an MOU under two protocol with 200 plus nations and, uh, and governments, subnational governments around the world. That's leadership. We wanna build on that work. The US clients, uh, uh, US Alliance, Climate Alliance, we wanna build on that. The Pacific Coast Collaborative, we wanna build on that. And we wanna build on the framework of our cap and trade program, build on the framework uh, of all of these audacious goals on electric vehicles, all of our audacious goals on waste and diversion, and all our audacious goals as it relates to getting to 100% uh, clean energy. But we've got to fast track all of that if we're going to, I think, be judged well in the future. Because right now, uh, everything we've done has been adequate. Continue to do what you've done, you'll get what you got. And so that's why I'm here a little more animated, you know, explaining this to my four kids, my little four-year-old uh, who's, you know, moved from talking about a novel coronavirus, actual language a four-year-old uses, to now talking to me about what is going on outside and why you can't play around with a soccer ball outside. Um, that's not the world I want to leave to my kids. It's not the world you want to leave to your kids. This is not a world that anyone should be experiencing. And we don't have to. Our decisions, not conditions, that will determine our fate and future. And so I'm very, very proud of California's leadership in the absence of national leadership. And I recognize our responsibility, again, to accelerate those efforts. So with that, I just want to ask Wade and Jared perhaps to either one of you come up, both of you, maybe amplify um, uh, some of what I may have said and maybe talk a little bit more about what we've been talking about the last few weeks as we're experiencing this historic fire season. Hi, Jared Blumenfeld, I'm the Secretary of Cal EPA. I uh, just want to start by really saying, you know, the governor framed it as a leadership issue. Just the profile in leadership that is the governor. Um, I've had the privilege of, of working with the governor for a long time. When they're difficult issues, you know, if you, if you just imagine the beginning of this administration. I remember the governor, the last governor hadn't even left office and we had the first fires come in. Day upon day upon day upon day, the state has been buffeted by emergencies. And when it comes to making tough decisions, the governor has made them and they're not always popular decisions. And climate is one of those issues that we all know as Californians is here. I think the scientists told us in reports after reports that it, it would be coming 20 years from now. 20 years from now, we'd be facing what we're facing right here today in Oroville. And I just wanted to start by saying, be safe, first of all. Like, we have these masks, they've become like the the Swiss army knives, like they're, they're good for COVID, but they're really good for the crampy air as well. And make sure we're using them. Um, the N95 is really helpful. On, you, on your phone, you can get an app that shows you the air quality. Right here, right now, the air quality index is 508. Uh, it's healthy below 50. Um, so really right now is the time to take care of your lungs, especially if you've got kids, folks in your family with asthma, the elderly, this is a time to really make sure that you're not going outside. This is not a time if the air quality is dangerous and you can get lots of different apps that tell you the air quality from the Air Resources Board and others. Um, please, 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 like, um, we don't have to be breathing this air. Um, and also make sure the air quality in your home, if you have the opportunity to get an air filter, um, really I'd advise one. Next thing, the governor, like he phoned late at night, both Wade and I, um, and we work as a big climate team within government and said, we need to do more and we need to do it faster. And he reiterated like, wait, Jared, this really is a climate emergency. We really need to tackle this um, as if our lives depended on it because they do. And so that sense of urgency that you hear from the governor, he's pushing on us to make sure we look at every single aspect. Um, and he's right, California is leading the nation 
when it comes to renewable energy. It is leading the nation when it comes to electric vehicles. It is leading the nation when it comes to building efficiencies. And I actually want to thank everyone um, for doing their part. Um, the governor called on us two weeks ago to prevent blackouts. People around the state, big businesses, small businesses contributed. And even things like using less water and, and you know, helping for drought actually helped save energy as well because a lot of our energy in the state is moving water around. So literally everything that you've all been doing, um, appreciate it. We, we want to make it easier. We, we want to make it so that it's second nature, so that you're not even thinking about, you know, replacing that light bulb because you replaced it with an LED 15 years ago. So we want to save you money. And that, I think, really is the governor's point. Many of the policies that contribute to, to climate change are actually hard on your pocketbook. And we're trying to create an economic recovery that's based on a innovation. And, you know, I don't really know anyone in my life that's more of an innovator than the governor. Like how we use innovation to springboard our economy future into the future is really by green jobs, um, a green economy. So main thing today I'd want to say is be safe. If those numbers are above 50, which most of the state is, please don't go outside. Um, get one of these N95 masks because you do have to go outside and, and monitor it. And then we'll be coming, we'll be, the governor's asked us month after month to give him proposals that show what we're doing, to activate um, what we're doing. And Wade and I had the chance of going to a climate conference. Everyone around the world is looking to see what California is doing. And I'm just incredibly grateful that we have a leader like Governor Newsom who's not only leading California, but leading the world when it comes to climate. Wade? Thanks, Governor, and thanks, Jared. Uh, I'd start by locating us and sharing a little bit about where we are right now. Uh, we are in the Lofer Creek portion of the Oroville State Recreation Area, and that is a beloved uh, recreational uh, asset in this part of the state, um, one of 280 state parks uh, in our state. The Oroville State Recreation Area, the undeveloped portion around the lake, burned over about 70% uh, in, in the last number of days. Uh, more uh, broadly, across our state park system, 10 of our 21 park units uh, have been impacted by these recent fires, including, of course, Big Basin State Park that the governor toured last week. State parks are a point of pride for Californians. Uh, and really one of the crown jewels of an amazing natural uh, ecosystem we have in California. And I think as we talk about the human cost of these impacts, we have to also uh, elevate the natural resource impacts of these fires. Uh, fact is, California has world-renowned nature and world-renowned biodiversity of plants and animals. And when you talk about almost three and a half million acres of California land, that's over three and a half percent of the state burning, major impacts uh, to our environment uh, and certainly our watersheds. Uh, we stand in a very important watershed for the state uh, in the state water project. And the fact is these fires uh, damage our water watersheds. They also, of course, damage our infrastructure. Uh, we know from the energy challenges of the last couple of weeks where fires knocked out transmission lines um, that climate-driven catastrophic fires threaten the infrastructure that brings us uh, our daily standard of living. On the energy side, but also the water side, we're not far from the Hyatt Power Plant at the Oroville Reservoir that actually had to relocate operations downstream because of fire threats. So these challenges are real to people and communities, to nature, to our infrastructure. And I think but what both Governor and Jared said is absolutely true. We're seeing impacts today that we thought would materialize by mid-century. And that's a really important point uh, because we used to talk about climate adaptation or climate resiliency as sort of a future planning exercise, a little bit of a kind of wonky forecasting effort. The fact is, Climate resilience is about protecting our people and our nature now. Uh, so under the governor's direction, we're increasingly focused on, you know, with Jared's leadership, how do we drive down carbon pollution? We need to uh, obviously transform our, our transportation, our building, our energy system. But then what, what steps can we take to actually uh, reduce pollution and protect people and nature from the climate impacts that are already here? 
So I'm really excited to uh, be helping to lead on this effort, uh, really focused on climate resilience and where can we find uh, ways to continue to lead the world reducing carbon pollution, but in ways that recognize the reality, which is as we do that, we need to do more uh, to protect uh, our communities and our natural places. Uh, so I'm really excited about the work that CAL FIRE has continued to do on the, on the uh, proactive uh, front of, of really reducing wildfire risk to communities, um, even while they do heroic work responding to these wildfires. Uh, and as the governor said, um, while we can uh, be, be proud of what's happened in California, we have to do so much more. And that's what we're looking forward to doing in the coming months and years. Thank Jared and Wade, and you may know both of them have a long history of being environmental champions. And, and Jared left the Obama administration representing the EPA on the West Coast of the United States, and Wade was in the Brown administration. And both have a little history with me when San Francisco was leading this state in many respects, cities across the country in terms of some of our efforts to establish new expectations in terms of our low carbon efforts. And so we're bringing a world-class team back uh, and we've got a lot of work to do. Look, let's talk just briefly and I'll open it up to questions in a moment. Uh, we have now currently have five active fires that are five of the most destructive uh, fires over the last, uh, in the history of the state, five of the 20 most destructive uh, that are currently uh, uh, being uh, uh, suppressed, which is just remarkable when you consider that. Uh, we just came out August, the hottest in recorded history. Uh, 19 people have lost their lives uh, in these fires. Uh, we uh, anticipate uh, that number may potentially go up as we get back into areas that have been ravaged by uh, flame and obviously smoke begins to clear. Uh, 3,900 plus structures have been destroyed. Uh, many more structures we anticipate uh, we will learn about over the course of the next days uh, and weeks. Here's the good news. Uh, the weather is beginning to cooperate. The good news is the winds have settled down. The good news is there's weather uh, starting uh, to appear offshore uh, that will create environment where we may get a little bit of precipitation, a modest amount of precipitation. Uh, in a perverse uh, reality with all this smoke, it cools the temperatures down, the smoke blanketing now the state of California. It actually advantages some of our efforts in terms of mitigating the spread. The only downside by definition uh, is the air quality and then the inability for some of our air resources uh, to get in. But nonetheless, the spread is mitigated as a consequence. We've made great progress on the LNU complex and the SCU complex, the CZU complex. Uh, we are making progress on this complex of fires, 23% contained uh, in this northern complex, otherwise referred to in the past as the Bear uh, Fire, uh, 253,000 acres uh, roughly are uh, in this current complex. The August fire in this state is the largest in California history. Uh, it currently is a 24% containment. That August complex is 747,000 acres just that one complex of fires, 747,000 acres alone. Uh, again, something we've never seen in our lifetime. And so I want to just, again, express deep respect, admiration for all of our frontline uh, uh, folks out there doing uh, the hand crew work, doing the work uh, on uh, making sure we're dozing, creating these breaks, uh, not just the suppression efforts of CAL FIRE and all of mutual aid, also local law enforcement, our sheriff, California Highway Patrol, uh, police uh, that have really come to the aid of so many on the evacuations, our health and human service teams working in a COVID protocol environment uh, to help people safely uh, navigate our congregate shelters and provide opportunity to isolate and quarantine into hotel rooms in a way we haven't done in the past. Um, I'd be remiss not referencing all of that uh, and acknowledging their extraordinary work and couldn't, again, uh, be more pleased or proud of that. With that, I also today uh, have a piece of legislation that I'll be signing that is relevant and impactful. Uh, we noted a few months ago in anticipation this wildfire season, we had a series of public events 
in anticipation of this wildfire season. Uh, we had updated folks on the work we were doing on our vegetation and forest management, the historic amount of resources uh, that we were putting into preparing for this year's wildfire season. But we also marked because of COVID and because of other circumstances related uh, to reduction in availability of incarcerated um, um, personnel that could help uh, provide some supplemental support for CAL FIRE in terms of providing suppression and hand crew help uh, through CDCR, California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, that we supplemented our workforce, our seasonal workforce, by 858 people. Um, I announced last week we had hired 830. Uh, today, I can uh, uh, state that all 858 uh, firefighters have been hired pursuant uh, to that emergency supplemental um, that we had appropriated a few months back. But one of the things that we have been working towards for a number of years, going back to the Brown administration, uh, where there were efforts last year where we made progress, uh, but this year where we actually got this done. Eloise Reyes, thank you for your leadership, incredible leadership, uh, stewarding a bill uh, that uh, will uh, help give people opportunity and hope. And those are those prisoners that are out there, thousands of prisoners that are on the front lines uh, that are near the end of their time in prison, that are getting credits uh, and want the opportunity because of the training they're receiving once they're out of the system to be able to potentially join a workforce of which they've been trained and have actively participated in heroic ways uh, of, uh, of, of, of advancing, meaning their suppression efforts are demonstrable when you see them. This bill that I'm about to sign uh, will give those prisoners hope of actually getting a job in the profession that they've been trained. Uh, and I just wanna thank everybody in the legislature, the legislative leaders and others that supported this bill. Small number of people uh, didn't feel it was appropriate to give these folks a second chance. Uh, and uh, that was unfortunate. Uh, but the good news, what's fortunate, enough did. Uh, and I'm looking forward uh, to signing this uh, piece of legislation here in a moment. Uh, and I just want to thank Scott Butnick, so many people I can thank for their advocacy in this space. I want to thank Brian Rice and the California, um, a lot of the leaders uh, within our California unions uh, that recognize this moment and the opportunity uh, to do this in a thoughtful and judicious way. So I'm belaboring this except to say um, I'm, uh, I brought this piece of legislation appropriately, I thought, here today um, that uh, uh, will give these these uh, future firefighters and emergency personnel uh, a chance by getting them opportunity to expunge their records, giving them a chance to get a certificate, getting a chance to potentially get a career ladder coming out of prison. So let me sign that and we'll answer any questions. And this is uh, AB 2147 for the record. So this is official. Uh, and very grateful again uh, to Eloise Reyes for her outstanding work. So that's it in a nutshell. I, I can do a COVID update if you wish. 3,200 uh, plus uh, new positive cases down to 3.7% uh, positivity over the seven day period. Uh, we are making progress in that space. We'll update you more uh, over the weekend and uh, in our Monday presser. Happy to take questions. Hi, it's Dale Kassler from the Sacramento Bee. Um, when you talk about accelerating the climate change efforts, uh, first of all, uh, was it a mistake for the state water board recently to uh, postpone the, uh, the planned shutdowns of those power plants in Southern California in the name of grid reliability? I mean, that takes us a step back, doesn't it? Uh, it was absolutely not a mistake. It was the right thing to do. Uh, three plants uh, will be extended for three additional years. One, the Redondo plant for one year. It was necessary in order to create and provide for reliability. We're simply coming too close in terms of megawatt peak usage and load, uh, and we need to address reliability, particularly moving into the new year, 2021, 2022. Uh, so absolutely was the right decision to do. Uh, and while you have a small step back, uh, we're going to make giant leaps forward to make that negligible in the context uh, of our total overall strategies. So when you talked about uh, getting to 100% uh, green energy, uh, green grid by 2045, is that, are you talking about a new piece of legislation? What specifically are you gonna do to, to, to attack some of these issues? 
Well, I, th I think 2045 is too late. So absolutely, we're looking to fast track all of these efforts across the spectrum, across the board. Uh, we've already reached our RPS portfolio uh, goal in 2018 of 34% uh, ahead. It was a 33% goal ahead of the 2020 deadline, proving California uh, can move into the future uh, and grow its economy. Uh, we accordingly are generating over 50% of all our electricity from non um, uh, non-fossil fuel for, uh, sources, that includes hydroelectricity and the nuclear that we are generating. That's not part of the RPS, but nonetheless gives you a sense of, of the totality of California's efforts moving in this space. So we think we're not only up to the challenge, we're more than capable of achieving uh, more audacious goals. And so we are currently in the process of putting together new ideas, new strategies to uh, accelerate our efforts, uh, accelerate the application implementation of commitments we previously made and, and to look at these goals, these stretch goals of 2045 uh, and see if we can pull them closer into the future. Okay, I'll uh, ask some questions from the pool now. This first one is from uh, Keeley Webster of uh, the bond buyer. Uh, do you know how much uh, grant money you're expecting from FEMA for each of the counties that, that you've uh, sought assistance for? Is there any uh, concern about the availability of FEMA money now that President Trump has suggested he might take money from FEMA for the CARES too? Well, we're, we're the beneficiary, the state of California, of over $4 billion that's being redirected from FEMA into our unemployment uh, and PUA system. Uh, we uh, are getting those checks out and uh, we're doing so as quickly as possible and we're hoping uh, that very shortly Congress, Senate in particular, uh, can get their act together uh, and allow for more certainty moving forward and a new source of funds and not redirecting from existing uh, FEMA reserves. That said, specific to the question, a Pete Gaynor, uh, head of FEMA was out here in the state, spent two days with us touring uh, the wildfire damage throughout the state of California. We have extraordinary partnership uh, with FEMA, uh, not only with Pete, but the regional director, Bob, uh, and others. And so we have all the confidence in the world uh, that we'll continue to, uh, in the spirit of partnership and collaboration uh, to, uh, to see the kind of support uh, into the future that we've received in the past. Uh, and I also have confidence uh, based upon the totality of these climate-induced emergencies that are not just wildfire-related, but also hurricanes uh, in other parts of the country, uh, that Congress will see to it and the President will see to it that appropriate resources are made available to support those in needs. And so, no, I'm not concerned about those dollars running out. Okay, thank you. This is from uh, Carla Marinucci from Politico. President Trump has been silent on California and Western wildfire fires. While he's tweeted on numerous issues and races, he's golfed and attended, attended campaign rallies. His last lament on California's current situation was three weeks ago. What's your reaction to his, uh, his failure to publicly address this latest devastation? Well, I can only speak to the, the conversations I've had with the president. I spent close to 30 minutes on the phone with the president yesterday, specific to the wildfires here in California. We walked through uh, the current status report on the active fires, the larger complexes. We actually specifically talked about Butte County and some of the recovery efforts from the campfire. Uh, and he reinforced his commitment uh, to our effort. And we were grateful uh, yesterday to announce two new we refer to as FMAGs uh, that were approved by FEMA and the administration. The major disaster declaration that was approved uh, a number of weeks ago uh, that has helped advance our efforts to provide assistance, not just business assistance uh, and county uh, support, but also uh, the prospect now shortly of individual assistance to individuals that have been impacted uh, and evacuated uh, from these fires. So uh, he has been proactive in that sense. Um, and uh, to the extent that he has made public comments, I imagine there'll be more public comments forthcoming based upon the conversation I had with him yesterday. Okay. This, thank you. This is from Sherry Mossberg at CNN, and you, and you alluded to the uh, the MOU from last month. Um, in the name of safety, what is the state doing to better manage and restore the forest and mitigate wildfire threat? And how does the new memo of understanding with the federal government play into that? Uh, it plays directly into that. California last year moved forward uh, to no longer twiddle our thumbs and talk about uh, or lament about. Uh, the good old days when we were more active in vegetation and forest management, we decided to do something about it. In fact, uh, one of the first 
actions I took as governor of the state of California. I went up to Placer County on a ridge and talked about the imperative of doing some forest management, some thinning, uh, and some prescribed burns to address a population vulnerability so we didn't experience another campfire. Uh, we were able to commit to 35 high-profile projects uh, impacting and advancing our efforts to protect some 200 vulnerable communities in the state of California. Uh, a few months back, we announced the completion of all 35 of those high profile projects. We stated a few months ago that there were a number of those projects that were not due to be completed for over a decade. We were able to get them done a uh, little over one year. We are committed to doubling down on those efforts, and that is exactly the spirit of the partnership that we advanced this memorandum of understanding with the U.S. Forest Service to basically double the commitment in terms of annual number of acreage that are managed more efficiently and effectively in partnership with the state of California. Uh, the goal is to get to a million acres a year. We recognize that's uh, not uh, a stretch goal. Uh, that is the first goal of what we hope are subsequent announcements to go even farther and to do even more because we recognize we're going to have to do more. But it was a significant milestone, a significant step forward because the U.S. Forest Service in the state of California had not entered into any similarly uh, placed pro uh, uh, commitments in the past. And so it's, it's a positive development. It's a good sign. It comes with real resources from the federal government, and it forces us to step up our efforts as the federal government does the same. And so it's, uh, again, one of, we hope, many announcements that we'll be making over the course of many, uh, the next number of months, and we certainly hope over the next few years. Is there money committed in that MOU, or is it just sort of a pledge, this is what we want to do? No, there's resources committed by the federal government that come from a recent bill that the President of the United States signed uh, going back, what, a couple of weeks ago? Uh, and that bill comes, what the name of it was? The Great Outdoors Act? Yeah, the Great Outdoors Act. So substance, it goes from the provisions of the Great Outdoors Act, this memorandum of understanding will allow us actual resources. So it's more than just a piece of paper. Uh, it's not just symbolic, it's substantive. And it's also substantive in a different way that it allows us to really prioritize together the most impactful projects where we're not just doing things in parallel track, we're now doing things with real partnership uh, and greater sense of urgency and intentionality. Okay, thank you. This is uh, from, I'll throw in a uh, coronavirus question. This is from Mackenzie Mays at Politico. It looks like the Sacramento area school where your children uh, attend has received a waiver from the state to open. Um, do you plan to send your children back to the campus when they reopen, or are they going to continue with distance learning? Well, I, let me, uh, I'll, I'll let you know after I process that with my wife. I, I know better to answer that question uh, without caucusing with, uh, with the leadership in the House. Fair enough. Uh, sorry, bear with me a second That's here as we... Uh, this is from uh, Curtis Ming at CBS 13 in Sacramento. Um, when the power is cut, so are the normal lines of communication. Uh, people in a fire's path may not have access to phones, TV, or internet. Um, those who do have cell service may only have a signal until the cell's backup generator runs out of fuel. Uh, as these fires become more common, what are you doing to make sure those in remote communities have access to critical communication when they need it most? I'd, I'd uh, refer the questioner to the work that the uh, California Public Utilities Commission did last year, the work that we did collectively, the state legislature, myself, uh, to uh, work with all three of the largest investor-owned utilities in the state of California, not least of which uh, PG&E, uh, with new processes, new protocols, new expectations uh, to make sure that we are being uh, much more responsive to the needs of vulnerable communities, particularly rural and remote parts of this state as it relates to any de-energization, what is referred to as PSPS. Those protocols have been changed. They have been advanced. Uh, they're more targeted. They're more limited. Uh, and they come with resources that not only the IOUs are responsible for, but the resources we put up in the state of California uh, to create new resource centers, cooling centers, uh, to provide for backup generation, to provide for support for vulnerable communities, uh, to provide for resources uh, to address precisely the concerns that were raised in that question. Also would note we continue to 
work with the largest telecommunication firms uh, in this state uh, to require uh, new backup generation as it relates to their pro, uh, polls, to their SMS systems, to their telecommunication network. Uh, and we'll continue to do more in that space. We made a little progress. We have more work to do in that space. I want to just compliment the extent uh, it's important. Uh, Senator McGuire and others, uh, Jim Wood, that have been very active in this space, supporting northern communities here in the state of California uh, and really trying to hold everybody, private, public sector, accountable uh, for delivering on all of the above. Were you satisfied with how PG&E handled the, the PSPS from the other night? I'm getting an after action report, so I'll be able to more substantively answer that question with more nuance and specific information. Uh, broad strokes, uh, the impacts of the PSPS uh, were more modest in terms of length and more modest in terms of scope than likely they would have been a year ago, pursuant to the new rules and regulations, the 72-hour notification, et cetera, that was put into place uh, based upon the new rules that we established legislatively, executively, and through the California Public Utilities Commission. So at, at first look, uh, I was more satisfied, uh, but I cannot claim to be Firm, uh, firmly satisfied until I get the details uh, which are forthcoming and will be provided to me very shortly. Um, uh, another question from me. Uh, in, re in regard to uh, all that you've done in the last two years, I believe the legislature has appropriated something like a half billion dollars for more equipment, more personnel for CAL FIRE, and yet the theme of the last few weeks we keep hearing is we're stretched too thin. We yeah. don't have enough. Uh, we're hoping, you know, we hope they, they send the cavalry from Montana or whatever. Yeah. Has the state just simply not done enough? No. It, I, look, you have 14,000 lightning strikes between August 15th and August 18th. Um, dry lightning strikes. You have a heat dome over the entire west coast of the United States that precipitates in world record breaking temperatures in your state. Uh, those are conditions uh, that even the, the most uh, well, abundant and well-resourced into the extreme uh, uh, agencies uh, still would overwhelm, uh, be overwhelmed by. So that's the challenge. Uh, look, we provided uh, substantially more money in ongoing support to CAL FIRE this year, baseline money. Uh, I did a, a supplemental of over $72 million for those seasonal firefighters. Uh, that couldn't have happened at a better time. And I just noted all 858 were hired. Uh, we have more suppression technology than we've ever had in the past. And what I mean by that is LIDAR technology, access to Pentagon information from satellites, the ability to access uh, now uh, technology that is part of our new uh, um, well, procurement of helicopters, these new Black Hawk helicopters that are finally starting to roll in, uh, access to other tools of technology as it relates to drones uh, and wildfire and infrared cameras that we did not have. Have, uh, in our possession uh, uh, that were distributed as broadly as they have been this year. All of that's happened in the last uh, year and a half. Uh, we'll continue to do more. We'll continue to provide more resources, more personnel, uh, more uh, predictive technology. We have an incredible partnership uh, on wire, wildfire uh, monitoring and wildfire prediction technology based upon weather uh, that allows us to, uh, uh, to prevent uh, the spread of fires based upon uh, the pre-distribution uh, and pre-deployment of personnel. It's technology that we didn't have a year ago that we have today that also will help with our firefighter suppression. So a lot of progress, just simply not enough. And that's why we're here uh, talking in the terms we should around a climate emergency, a climate crisis uh, that needs uh, to enliven all of us in this nation where this nation has a responsibility to lead the world and to address. And I'm told this is the last question. It's from Lorraine Dector. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, from uh, Action News Now and Chico Redding. Uh, what other plans do you have in uh, Butte County today? Uh, any other meetings or actions taking place? Yeah, we'll be, we'll be touring around. I, 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 
Hope I've been a familiar face up here in Butte County, certainly uh, from the ravages, the wildfires that were experienced here after the campfire uh, and some of the subsequent removal of debris uh, and rebuilding efforts. We've tried to be here for the community to the extent possible in terms of our support of property tax, uh, property tax support, school system support, uh, supplementing some of the economic losses in this area. I just want to express, if I could, uh, and thank you for this question, uh, the opportunity to express what I should have from the outset of this uh, conference, and that is my deep respect and empathy uh, for the human uh, element and the impact uh, that uh, the last three years, uh, that impact of all of these emergencies uh, have had cumulatively on this community, uh, from the campfire alone to the spillway uh, issues to uh, hear once again the PTSD that people are struggling with and suffering with, the emotional impact. I won't ever forget going to the first day of school up here in Paradise, the community surrounding Paradise, uh, where, where the teacher told me on that first day of school uh, that the kids had seen some fog uh, outside uh, their windows. And literally, uh, a number of the kids broke down uh, emotional because they thought the fog represented the smoke related to the aftermath uh, of the Paradise Fire. Uh, that PTSD is real. Uh, that impact on children in particular is overwhelming. And so my respect, my empathy uh, for everybody suffering, this community in particular, and that's one of the reasons specifically I wanted to come back up here today uh, to lay, came, lay claim to a, an appreciation, uh, but also uh, a responsibility to be supportive, not throughout uh, this current crisis, but to be here, as I said, uh, two years ago, a year ago, uh, and I'll say it again, for the long haul, to make sure we're here as part of the recovery uh, and making sure we're here part of building a more resilient community and doing more to prevent these fires in the future. And so with that, let me just again express uh, my gratitude to uh, all of those leaders, not only here in the Butte community, uh, but the surrounding communities throughout the state of California addressing these historic wildfires. I expect real progress in the next number of days. Weather conditions are more favorable. Some of these larger complexes, we are making tremendous progress. Uh, I expect as well some of the air quality to begin to improve in the next number of days, measurably improve in the next number of days. Uh, and you should expect in return the efforts in the state to be doubling down in terms of prevention, suppression strategies, and long-term solutions that are foundational and fundamental uh, for our fate and future. Not only as it relates to wildfire resiliency, but the fate and future uh, of our health and our economy. And that's the address, addressing the issue head on of climate change uh, and addressing climate denialism, uh, which just also needs to be uh, addressed head on. And I'll close with one final statement. Uh, I heard uh, from Jared Bloomfeld, he said something about changing light bulbs. And the only thing that came into my mind is we can't just change light bulbs. We also need to change leadership. And I don't mean that just as a knock. Don't just assume I'm just taking a cheap shot uh, from a top-down federal prism. I mean that across the spectrum. If people are still in denial and they're leading the charge of keeping you protected and keep you healthy and safe, and they're in denial about climate change, they're not truly, I think, positioned to be the kind of leaders that we need for your community, for the state and our nation into the future. This is that serious and it requires a seriousness of purpose, a seriousness of understanding, a seriousness of consciousness around science and mother nature and the realities of the world that we're living in. So I just wanna conclude with that. And again, thank everybody for uh, being here. Uh, and thank you all those of you that may still be tuned in for the privilege of your time. Take care everybody.